In this video I attempt to beat Dragon's Dogma in hard mode but still try to make it as easy as humanly possible, so that even someone coming home blackout drunk at 3am in the morning could beat it, or in other words my average league teammates. To achieve this I will glitch, exploit and abuse the hell out of the game systems as much as possible and show once more that ultimately nothing beats the power of capitalism. So without further ado let's dogma this dragon straight back to hell. After a little tutorial, some cutscenes and the character creation in which we created the most handsome and charming dude possible and definitely not a scary low budget version of Rick Sanchez, we skip through the dialogues, ignore everyone in town for they are not worthy to be part of our plan and head straight to the next destination. At the gates we meet Rook, our first pawn but we don't really care about him and move on. So the first half hour or so we play the game as intended, arriving at the encampment, defeating the ogre and creating our own primary pawn. Mind you that all of this is still in normal mode since we want to get a few things done here that will help us out when we switch to hard mode. After defeating the ogre the game normally wants us to talk to a bunch of people and defeat the hydra next. But we don't like taking orders so we head back to Casardis and wait till it's night time. From there we head to the docks and talk to this lovely woman over here who grants us access to the DLC area. I also mistakenly accepted Madeline's quest at the inn but we don't want either Madeline or our pawn accompanying us since they would just be in our way. So let's just get rid of them real quick. Here we are, the Bitter Black Isles. A maze-like dungeon filled with the deadliest creatures Dragon's Dogma has to offer. And since pretty much every enemy in here would one-shot us, we must resort to the age-old strategy of running past every enemy and hoping they don't get us. After some skillful dodges and strategic rests, we arrive at our destination, the Duskmoon Tower. This is a sort of safe space in the dungeon where all you have to worry about are some easy killable snakes and spiders. It has a merchant and most importantly 8 sealed doors with very valuable loot inside. You see to open those doors you normally would have to scour the bitter black isles for so called moonbeam gems and use them on the doors. But today we're gonna take an alternative approach. Because as it turns out the only key you really need in dragon's dogma are barrels. Let me show you. If we pick up a barrel and position ourselves in the corner of one of the moon gem doors, put the barrel down and jump as if our life depends on it, because in this run it does, we will eventually glitch through the door. Ah yes, classic video game shenanigans. This works because as we put down an object it loses all of its collision just for a few moments. But it will stay that way for as long as we're inside said object. So by constantly jumping and pressing forward we will eventually get lucky and be outside of the barrel which will then gain its collision back and this will push us straight through the door. Because you know that seems to be easier for the game than simply moving the barrel back or something. So we do this little trick 7 times, fuck up the 8th time and get ourselves some tasty loot. What we're after here are mainly the Ring of Perseverance and the Dragon's Eye Shortbow. The ring because it increases our discipline gain by 50% which lets us learn new skills way faster and the bow well because it's literally over 5 times stronger than the one we have currently equipped. Now all we have left to do is to sell the rest of the loot for massive profit and we're good. But not before we test our new baby so let's just head back a bit and ah yeah just the result we wanted. Well ok some of you may look at this footage and think that it's taking forever to kill the cyclops and you would be kinda right. So let me give you guys a short introduction to the weapon system in Dragon's Dogma real quick. As you can imagine the bow we just equipped is way too strong for our current level. But the neat thing about Dragon's Dogma is that the game lets us equip whatever weapon we want as long as our current class can use it. So no matter the level as a strider we can always equip every dagger, bow or short bow we can get our hands on. But of course not without any drawbacks, every time we attack with a weapon it costs stamina. And the higher the discrepancy between our level and the weapons level, the higher the stamina cost. Mind you at this point in the game we are still like level 3 or 4 and the bow's level is 46. That means after 3 shots we have to wait for our stamina to refill or else our character will gasp for air like he just ran a whole marathon. 
but since the Bitter Black Isles are one of the toughest areas in the game, we should be able to pretty much one-shot most of the early non-DLC enemies in the game even in hard mode. Speaking of which, now it's finally time to up the difficulty of the game. So let's head back into the main menu and from there select hard mode. Doing so forces us to start the game over, so let's just skip all of the boring stuff we already did before and jump right back in where we left. Except we are now able to pick up all of the weapons and gold we collected previously from the item storage. So with an exorbitant amount of gold and one of the strongest weapons in the game, we can finally start playing the game. Well, we could if it weren't for the fact that this is a completely fresh save file, which in turn means that all of the loot in the Duskmoon Tower has never been looted by us. And yeah, you guessed it, we're gonna do this whole glitching thing again, because you know how the saying goes, the greedier you are, the more Jesus loves you. So after another hour or so of glitching through doors, hey, I never said that I was going to beat the game fast, okay? We head back to our friend Barak, which we will force to buy all of our stuff for an insane amount of money again. Well, almost all of our stuff. We keep the ring of perseverance, so we effectively gain double the discipline points throughout the game. But now, finally the time has come and we can get on with the actual game. So after the fight against the Cyclops at the gates, another beast threatens the encampment. This time it's a giant snake, oh wait, two giant snakes, no, three, oh my god, it's four snakes. Well, I wonder if we're able to beat her, surely this beast will take every ounce of skill we can spare, especially in hard mode, right? Well, no, after a few throw blasts and some attacks with our fancy bow, one of the heads spontaneously decides to deattach and the rest of the Hydra retreats. The next part is a bit of a slog where no amount of money could help us speed things up. You see lovely Mercedes over here would like us to bring the freshly severed Hydra head to the capital as a gift for the king. Or something like that. Unfortunately this is done via escorting this really, really slow ox cart which decides to stand still as long as enemies are nearby. And guess what, there are plenty of them. So yeah, this is going to take some time even with one-shotting the enemies. So after 15 minutes of goblins, bandits and falling rocks that hit you with the precision of a special forces sniper, we finally made our way to the capital. There we learn some new skills, most notably the Bastion and Fortitude augments, which will reduce the physical damage taken by enemies, meaning small fries like bandits literally cannot hurt us anymore. Ah yes, I love standing above trash mobs. And also the dodge skill which lets us dodge roll without using any stamina. The best part, this is just as fast as running, which indeed does use stamina. So you know how we gonna move from now on. After that we head off to the pawn guild where we have to explore the everfall, which is basically just a huge underground tower of which we have to get to the bottom. Luckily we don't believe in fall damage and just somersault our way down. Once there, we examine the suspiciously glowing cracks on the floor, triggering an encounter with the definitely not hentai tentacles that will definitely not wrap around our legs, spreading them wide open. But just in case, let's make our way out here as soon as possible. After we escape the fangs of the mouth tentacles, Sir Duncan over here informs us that we are now certified worm hunters, meaning we can officially join the noble quest of, well, hunting worms and dragons and stuff. Or so I thought, because the first quest we are given only leads to this boring ass cave where two men have a jolly good time together. And look, who am I to judge anyone's lifestyle, but I'm here to slay dragons. So Sir Maximilian, what else you got? Route a monster infestation? Now that sounds more like my jam. Let's head back to Casadis and let's go. But before we start, please consider subscribing and liking, as it would really help my channel out. Back to the video. On our way to the quest we encounter some bandits and since their arrows only damage us for like 2 or 3 hit points, I came up with a new brilliant idea I wanted to test. Hear me out. What if we throw our pawn at them? Does it deal damage? Could this be a viable strategy? Are there any laws against domestic pawn abusement? So with only one of the bandits left I went to test my new strategy and… well it does damage but nowhere near any amount that would justify the risk of a civil lawsuit. Following the road further down we get to an old quarry and in there we find beside some bandits a massive cave troll, which we of course try to tease. You see I thought hiding in that little side cave and just pumping it full of arrows would be a big brain 1000 IQ move. 
but unfortunately the troll just didn't care about things like physically not fitting through the door. So after a few failed attempts to cheese him that way, I gave up and tried to lure him onto this platform as intended to open up the gate you can see there. And let me tell you, getting this fucker onto this platform is a whole challenge by itself. But after a few deaths and 5 minutes or so of trying, we finally made it and killed him pretty easily with some throw blasts. Once we are out of the quarry, the quest marker would point just straight ahead, but instead of following it, we make a turn to the left to this little encampment. Here we can find Jace, and you see, Jace here sells these blast arrows, which, similar to the throw blasts, are very strong. Unfortunately, he only has 15 in stock, which means to get more, we have to wait till he gets a new delivery. And we do this by simply talking to the conveniently placed guard 3 meters to the right, who lets us rest at the camp for a measly 100 gold. Remember, we are filthy rich and 100 gold is literally nothing for us. So for Jace to restock all of his 15 blast arrows, we need to rest for about 5 to 7 times. And we want as many of them as possible, so you can imagine, this will take a while. But after about 5 to 6 cycles of sleeping and buying, we encounter another problem. We cannot buy any more arrows because of the weight limit. But Dragon's Dogma wouldn't be Dragon's Dogma if there wasn't a solution for that. You see, how much our character is able to carry is not determined by any skill or distribution of attribute points like in other games. No, in Dragon's Dogma, it's our physique that determines how much we can carry. And as you can see, we made the most fragile human being to ever walk this planet. So you know what that means, it's time to hit the gym. And after weeks of strict diet, workout routines and protein shakes, we made it guys. We got checked. Well, in reality, we just killed a chest worm over and over for about an hour until he dropped a ton of rift crystals and then bought the Art of Metamorphosis, an item which lets us change our appearance. But hey, we can carry a ton of stuff now. We upgraded our maximum encumbrance from about 40 to a whopping 100. Meaning, back to buying blast arrows. And while we're at it, let's also stock up on some throw blasts. You've seen me using them quite a bit in this playthrough already and that's because they are massively overpowered. I mean, look at how I just decimated this griffin's health bar. If it wasn't such a coward and flew away, this would have been an easy kill. But we'll get him eventually. But as you probably just saw, the biggest downside of throw blast is that you literally have to equip them one by one via the menu. No hotkey or some kind of item wheel, just like in the good old days. And for the blast arrows, well, why don't you see for yourself? Finally, after we bought about 2 years worth of blast arrow stocks, it's time to move on with the quest. On our way there, we run past a few goblins and a dragon, which we both just gonna ignore because the dragon whops our ass harder than those Japanese mochi pounders. Trust me, I tried. After making our way past the enemies, we finally arrive at the castle. You see, normally how this quest would go is we would talk to this fellow over there, who will then let us join the storm on the castle and from there we just have to fight a bunch of enemies and monsters to free it. I will put a sped up video of the quest on the screen for you guys. But since we want to beat the game as easy as possible, we just do this. By killing this poor bloke and reporting back to the capital, we can now successfully complete the quest. Well, or at least report our failure. Now that we have completed two worm hunt quests, we are finally able to get into the castle and meet the duke. At the entrance to the great hall, we are greeted by this creepy little jester which looks like... You know what? No, I'm not gonna make fun of him for his looks. For all we know, he could be a wonderful person who helps orphans and... Oh, yeah, I'm definitely going to kill him. After we got mocked by the duke himself and were thrown in jail for trying to pick up the jester, I swear I just wanted to bring him to a quiet corner to talk to him, our next mission is to hunt and kill a griffin that's been troubling the local people. Told you we would get him eventually. But before we begin with the quest, we need to do a little shopping at the local inn. And look who's there, our old friend Madeline. Fortunately, she does not remember the little incident and is willing to sell us her stuff. The item we are looking for is the Conqueror's Periap. This item gives us a temporary strength buff and is stackable up to 4 times. We want as much as possible of them. And since Madeline only ever has 2 in stock at a time, this also will take a while. Once we are done, we are supposed to meet a group of elites outside the castle to help us hunt down the griffin, but we simply run past them and throw a spider onto the marked location to bait the beast. We take a few steps back, stack the damage buffs we just bought and kill the griffin within 5 or so seconds. 
Now as you may have noticed I used some mushrooms after the first few shots but that was just to replenish some of my stamina so I can attack without getting exhausted and lose precious time. Because you see how this quest normally goes is that we fight the griffin at this location until it decides to fly away to a nearby tower where there would be an epic showdown on top of it. But since we killed it so fast it just, yeah, died right here on the spot. After that we of course head back to Grand Soren to report back to Elders from whom we'll promptly get our next two quests. These are nothing special and I haven't really done anything particularly cheesy, hell in one quest I even just stood there doing nothing watching Mercedes getting beaten up, so let's just skip them real quick. Back in the castle we were so close to letting our intrusive thoughts win. But instead we just take on our next quest which makes us roll across half of the map for 5 minutes before some random guard runs up to us and basically says, you know what would be really funny, fighting a giant monster. Back in the capital from where you just came. Upon arriving there we see that the city is under attack from a giant cock, Catrice. Lucky for us this fight is another easy cheese as all we have to do is to position ourselves on the right spot to throw as many throw blasts against his face as possible which causes it to permanently stagger and render it unable to even attack us once. This shows once more that with enough money to buy infinite ammo or in our case throw blasts and blast arrows, there is just no problem that can't be solved. I mean at this point we might as well just throw bags of money at our enemies. And as if we don't have enough, the duke personally wants to thank us by giving us even more gold. Thanks buddy, that's exactly what we needed. The next quest leads us to the Great Wall, no not the one you think of right now, this Great Wall. And by now you know the drill, upon entering we do what we do best and simply ignore all of the enemies until we get to a chimera which we then pump full of blast arrows all while being roided up on conqueror's periapts. The guard which was hiding behind the door opens it up for us now that the beast is dead and we run up to the rooftop for our first mandatory fight which really took us a few tries. As you might have noticed up until now we mostly had to fight one individual boss to progress the story. Here however we have to kill multiple whites and their army of undead to win. Which in itself wouldn't be much of an issue but since we only can take a limited amount of blast arrows with us at a time, we have to play a little bit more cautious as we would have normally. Meaning taking out the undead on the ground with throw blasts while the whites shoot us with magic which can basically one shot us if we get hit. But after a few tries we manage to finally beat them and then Palpatine over here tries to make a grand speech but is promptly interrupted by the dragon. And by that I mean he's... he's dead. The dragon, which is by the way named Grigori, I just wanted to put it out there, then tells us to go after him if we dare and with that it's finally time to face him once again. But first let me get something from our storage real quick. So let's head back to Grand Soren, talk to the owner of the inn and... Oh, what's that? Could it be that this is a maker's finger that I've purchased before we let Fornival get arrested in the quest I have conveniently skipped to keep the tension up? Oh yeah, it really is. Okay, so for those who don't know what this is, it's basically a super expensive arrow and I'm talking 300k expensive that virtually lets us one shot every enemy in the game. Yes, even good old Grigori. I mean, come on, we kinda have to use the ultimate cheese if the game literally has a weapon intended for just that purpose. There is one catch though, aside from being extremely pricey obviously. It's only sold by Fornival, which now spends the rest of his life in jail, thanks to us not proving his innocence. And the game automatically saves upon firing the arrow, meaning if we don't hit Grigori first try, that's it, we have to fight him as intended. And since we literally never changed our equipment, this could be quite tricky. I mean we wear the same pants we had when we first started the game. So with our new secret weapon in our inventory, let's head back to the Great Wall and finally face the dragon. But not before we fought or rather rode our way through the exact same dungeon as at the beginning of the game. Foreshadowing! But now rather than simply fighting against the chimera, we have to lure it onto 4 pressure plates in order to open the gate and proceed. Yes, you heard right, 4. Yeah, I was ready for this to take ages. But to my surprise we managed to do it on the first try, I mean sure pretty much all of our healing items are gone but who needs them anyway am I right? Well certainly not us, because in the next chamber after a dramatic cutscene where we are supposed to care about someone who I have literally never seen my entire life, we load the maker's finger into our bow and it does what it's supposed to do, leaving us with the credits of the game. Well more some weird mid end game credits, because the game itself still goes on for a little bit. But before we move on let me show you real quick what the fight against the dragon would have looked like if we fought as intended.
pretty epic actually, but also the exact opposite of what this video is about. So with the dragon dead, we head back to the capital to find a huge gaping hole in the middle of the city. And a duke who wants to see us dead. Because you see, we got a little reverse field in situation going on over here and the duke thinks it's our fault. And so the next fight is literally throwing bombs at an elderly person. Of course, that doesn't sit too well with the guards and we escape into the huge hole I mentioned before. And the next part is pretty straightforward. This pawn over here gives us the quest to collect 20 wake stones or else we will endlessly fall into the everfall doomed to loop back to the start every time we reach the end. The best and I think the only way to get 20 wake stones is through good old farming. Lucky for us we won't have to leave the everfall because behind every door lies a little dungeon with enemies who drop exactly what we need. The only caveat though is that in order to unlock those dungeons we first have to defeat the beholder from wish.com because as long as we have not defeated it every door leads to this exact room. And this fight also took us a few tries, not because we lacked the damage, but because to actually deal damage to the boss we have to attack right when his eye is exposed. I mean it looks like it's obviously exposed all the time but the game has a different opinion and lets us only deal damage when the evil eye, that's his real name by the way, is attacking. But as we established before we don't have the best defensive stats so trying to aim while not getting one shot is hard. And that's when I noticed that a key part of our strategy in this run was missing. The distraction. No, but seriously, once we summoned our pawn, the boss only focused on him and the fight was over in about 30 seconds. After we farmed some wake stones and completed the quest, it was time for the real final boss. The Seneschal. And what can I say, we had to fight him 3 times and every time went exactly as you'd imagine. So upon beating him for the final time, we killed him, then ourselves and then let our pawn inherit our body. You deserved it my dude, you deserved it. And with that we have beaten the game in hard mode and the credits roll for the final time. So what's the conclusion of this challenge? Blast arrows are OP as well as throw blasts and if you have enough money to infinitely buy them even hard mode is a cakewalk. Showing us once more that nothing can beat capitalism. Not even a huge ass dragon. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more content. Bye.